Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of Tune In to Turn Fit. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Sharon, and correct me if I'm wrong when I say your last name, Blady. Yes, one of the few that gets it right. Points for you, David. <laughs> <laughs> Points for me. Um, so uh, I know, I'm aware that um, you're a, a coach, um, uh, we're more, more on the mental aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, you're also the, um, past uh health minister of manitoba yes that's really interesting um <laughs> and i was lucky enough to chat with you a few times on the course that you're actually helping design on mental health for a virtual health summit which is super super cool because the way you explained it to me and since i am a huge nerd um <laughs> it really relates and i don't want to share too much about it i want you to share more about it because it's talking about superheroes and it's in a different perspective than I ever heard before. Um, so would you be kind enough to elaborate on your take and why you choose superheroes? Okay, cool. Well, as you can see, again, you know, I'm, I'm purposely <laughs> outing myself as a nerd. This is the yeah. backdrop of my office. You know, it was, I was torn between, you know, do I go with Wolverine and Peggy Carter or do I do, um, you know, uh, Captain America is my backdrop. So this is, yeah, I'm a hardcore nerd. And, okay. and so all those different things that you talked about in terms of what I do and what I have done uh, comes, interestingly enough, from that geek perspective and having been a, a geek and recognizing that some, of, that some of the best lessons I was taught, I was taught, you know, through my love of comic books. And that strangely enough, um, as somebody that had lived experience, dealt with stigma in terms of uh, being open with it, you know, in terms of my family. And then ultimately my job, I went public about my mental health uh, while I was Minister of Health as a result of a crisis that emerged. But the language around superheroes actually started with my youngest one. And I talk about that a little bit in the course about how it was a turning point. I've raised my kids, you know, I was referred to as a Marvel mom and they get Star Wars as well and this and that. And so what happened was my youngest one, not only does he have a similar mental health profile to myself, but he's also got extra layers of neurodiversity and he went undiagnosed for a very long period of time and he was struggling in that time and I knew there were things going on, but we couldn't get that diagnosis. And so he came to me melting down and told me all the things that were wrong with him and why he was broken. And I found myself, and it's that, it's that wonderful thing that happens in your brain where a whole bunch of disparate things suddenly all come together. And I found myself telling him he wasn't broken, but he was like a mutant. He was an X-Man and he yeah. had mutant superhero powers. And then we just started a vocabulary based on that. And I found myself at first going, oh my God, have I just like blown smoke, you know, at my kid to make him happy in a five minute window? And I stopped and I thought about it. And I realized that that's actually what I've been doing my whole life. And I realized that as I started, as we started talking and I was needing to explain everything from how to get him to meditate and do mindfulness and do these other kinds of things that it's like, you know, I'm mom, really an eight year old. So thrilled about like mom telling them what to do, but Oh, now you want me to meditate. Yeah. I mean, I might as well have just walked up with like five bushels of burnt Brussels sprouts uh, and told yeah. him that's what he's eating for the next six months. So it was this it was this reframing to engage him and to empower him because I wanted him to understand that he wasn't broken. And I came to realize that in my own life, I, some of the, the most significant things I accomplished were because I had these traits that were you know, what other people would call a diagnosis and that when they had been working particular ways uh, and they were socially acceptable, oh, well, I was bright. I was well organized. I was, you know, this and that. But when they manifested in a way that wasn't, it's the, oh, wait a second, you're, you know, you've got this and now you need medication. Right. Well, wait a second. It's the same trait. And so this is where the harnessing of it. So, yeah, I... I figured I might as well use my nerd girl powers for good. And if it helps other people engage and see themselves and see others differently, um, then I think it helps break down. It's, you know, it's about educating, empowering, and ending stigma. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I can um, relate to it because you kind of explained on the case that, like on little things that I have when we chatted. So um, I'm dyslexic, but I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was actually an adult, till I was like 20. Um, I was in special reading classes, spelling, everything. 
reading. It's just after two minutes, it's just the brain is just like fried. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I like how you kind of pieced it together and like the old me had a lot more anxiety, depression, and through different uh, mental health uh, tools that I've adopted into my life and physical and stuff like that. It was nice. And then as soon as you talked about the superhero part, instantly I could just picture it and then picture how all these are assets. Yeah. I, and I, I personally don't like hearing lots of our clients say, oh, my diagnosis is this. And it could be as, as simple as I have scoliosis, so I'll never stand right. And I'm like, okay, well, you'll have, it'll be way harder, but let's work on that. But it's almost like an excuse to just give up. Mm -hmm on so many different things. So I could say, uh, I'm dyslexic, I cannot read. It's like, no, I don't like reading because it's harder. <laughs> I prefer an audio book. doesn't mm -hmm. mean I can't read anything. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned that too because I do work both in mental health but also with those things that other people call learning disabilities. And it's like, those are superpowers as well. That's, that's yeah. that. For me, it's about neurodiversity and how I look at it is, you know, it's again, and it goes to that true understanding of what superpowers are. Superpowers are inherently neutral. It's what you do with them. And so we see some people that harness them. And again, I think of, you know, Professor Xavier and his school for gifted children, where he teaches them how to harness them, how to manage them so that you don't lose control of them, and then how to use them not just for your own growth, but for the betterment of, you know, the world at large. Well, that's the same thing with how our brains are wired. My anxiety brain can take me from, you know, burnt lasagna to the apocalypse in 15 steps if I've lost yeah. control of it. The, the decision tree just goes right downwards. On the other hand, when I recognize that, oh, my brain just does decision tree thinking, I realized, well, hold on. I've got like great recognition. I've got the ability to strategic plan and that when you're a cabinet minister, especially health, oh my God, like there isn't a day when like a fire is not being thrown out in front of you to put out or to prevent. And so you get the briefing notes and you're able to sort of, you know, go, okay, wait a second, hold on. And I'm going to use that power on this. And what it's going to do is it's going to get me to a solution or carry something through further than people might have anticipated to prevent a problem. And again, I'm not asking them to come to step 15 with me, but recognize that the two or three steps that they've thought out aren't enough. They may seem like it, but I'm seeing all the other contingencies. And then the bonus part is that that part of my brain that's so anxious to do that, well, it gets burned out doing that. So if I burn dinner later on in the evening, it's like, yeah, whatever, guess we're going to take out. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's that kind of thing where you realize, okay, where am I using it? And, and I think if more folks understood the assets, Rather than, you know, again, I'm not saying that we're like special snowflakes and that we're better than people. But I think when we talk about, especially using, like I tend to use the Marvel Universe, people are a lot more sympathetic to young Peter Parker learning how to use his skills. Yeah. Or they're much more sympathetic to the trials and tribulations and the, you know, that Wolverine goes through. And, and what happens with him or, you know, and these different characters. And it's like, well, hold on. We give them a lot more empathy and compassion. And when they overcome, oh, my gosh, it's amazing. I mean, even when you see, like, the character arc of Tony Stark in the MCU. I mean, because yeah. it's a little bit of a you know, jerk there. But you watch the character growth. But a lot of that is literally him learning how to manage his powers and how you see it, it, it turns around. So this is where you go, okay, well, hold on. If you can think about those people that way why not think about yourself that way or why not think about your brother who's got that diagnosis that way or why can't you and so i love to also pull examples of characters that do have diagnoses so there's um whiz kid is actually one that i'm hoping is going to come out in the uh the new uh shang chi movie and he's actually he's a dyslexic character who's a phenomenal inventor and so he yeah he does these really cool things um Jubilee from the X-Men is also, she's got dyscalculia. And so there's all of these different things where they're now putting things in there. And then there's some other characters that you can extrapolate things from. So it gives people a safe space. 
to talk about these things and maybe see themselves differently. And for me, I mean, one of my first characters that I related to was Wolverine. And that's because I live with a lifetime and I'm still actually going through therapeutic supports for um, PTSD that goes back to my childhood and that how it's through domestic abuse and through other things has, it, it just got, you know, layered and layered. Um, but Wolverine, because I sat there going, okay, well, wait a minute. Wolverine is like the king of the crappy days. Like, I don't think I'll ever have a day as bad as him. But once his team surrounds him, and yes, there's going to be pushback, and yes, he's going to get into a little bit of a banter with Cyclops, but the point is they know that when he's back on his feet, he is the best loyalist guy out there. And, and if, if Wolverine's got your back, you're golden. So if on his crappiest days, he's still a superhero, he's no less Wolverine. Well, then you know what? I can cut myself some slack on a crappy day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And then because it's uh, storytelling is so important in life and as humans, and that's what we're, we're really gifted about. Yeah. And that's why when people like gossip, because it's story, a form of storytelling or back yeah. when there was only radio, you would hear different stories. So now you have this emotional investment in these characters from even your childhood. And then you can go back and relate and give yourself more empathy and be caring and, and kind and I think it's so cool like I, I wish that this was almost mandatory in all <laughs> schools because you need to learn it younger because it is super important when you're young imagine um, for everybody that's listening and including both of us when we were going to school and learning and knew that we had superpowers or abilities that we were a little bit better and more gifted at and then teachers can understand that too and then through that whole process even being like trying to pick a career like okay well um i'm good at this 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 and i love 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 doing it i'm being pushed into that which mm -hmm. doesn't resonate with me and then you know what to, to say like uh, okay i'll do this um so it, again you can do it with almost anything and then as business owners learn like so just learning about uh -huh. what how you teach and then I was like thinking on me as a personal level, but then now as a business owner too, I'm thinking, okay, when I'm hiring people, um, the people that like to be seen and in front of people, those are typically usually your secretaries, they need to be heard. Your accountants typically don't want to be seen or heard and they're just really insanely good with numbers and they want to be in the back. They don't want to be interrupted. Yeah. Um, so everybody has their own assets. And unfortunately, if you try to just push somebody into something, um, it doesn't work out as well as if they're just naturally gifted and feel loved and, and appreciated in, in their own superpowers. Well, and, and that's the other thing too, is that it's not just for those of us with like this perspective is not just for those of us with a diagnosis. So how I look at it is that not everybody is a superhero, but you never know when you might become one and that allies are always important. So it's one of those things like you can't have the Avengers without Nick Fury you need your Peggy Carters, you need those kinds of people. And that the better the allies are, you know, and, and the more understanding are there, they're not necessarily a buffer. But it's a case of it, 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 again, it shows that empathy. And then like I said, we always have characters that, you know, start off as an ally, um, you're Phil Coulson's, well, the next thing you know, <laughs> oops, yeah. he's on the other side of Tahiti. And guess who's now a superpower in his own way. So he walks in both worlds. And so you get those kinds of things happening where it's really just about um, taking away the pathology of it. And I think that's the other part of it for me is that thing that it even goes to our own stories. That if we can use these stories, then we can help rewrite our own stories because the stories that we tell each other, tell ourselves, especially if we've got some kind of a diagnosis, tends to focus on the shortcomings or the misunderstandings yeah. and frankly the trauma and this is the other part in terms of that intersection of mental health and other forms of neurodiversity i dare somebody to find a dyslexic kid that hasn't gone through trauma because at some point they were bullied they were meant to feel that they were less than or i mean i think of what happened with my own son where it's like so dyslexia dyscalculia dysgraphia and what was happening in the early grades here take an extra book home for homework here take an extra math sheet holy <laughs> way to go thanks you've just like leaned on his amygdala flooded his brain with cortisol and you have effectively shut down his prefrontal cortex and he has no executive decision making abilities yet and oh boy his anxiety's through the roof 
thanks for bringing gasoline and a match to the party. Um, so, but we can tell ourselves different kinds of stories where we can go, yeah, I got through that, but I actually have this. And so that's the other part is I encourage folks to find superheroes that they might relate to initially. So for example, anxiety and spidey senses is the, is the connection that I make. And it doesn't have to be like you have to identify with a character and say, oh, I am so-and-so, you can create your own. Or, yeah. I mean, what I tend to do is I tend to bop around, you know, based on what my mental health profile is, it's like, okay, having a bit of a spidey day over here. Oh, no, that got amped up and I am in full Tony Stark OCD. Who touched my sewing scissors? You cut paper with those, what? And then, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm like Tony yelling at his tech that he's gonna go, you know, donate it to a community college that acts up one more time. Uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, one that my kids even use um, that is Winter Soldier and the idea of Bucky and depression and how depression, and that's one of our code phrases now is which Bucky am I talking to? If they notice something. So you can, it's, it's whatever works. Like there's no hard and fast formula. It's more about a framework and a model because if it can also get people talking about mental health and especially with kids, I've, I've talked to kids at daycares and you, you, you talked about more feelings and I don't, you know, the slides are not as elaborate, but you get to, you know, you get them to share what they know about the character. And then you start using those places as launching off points to talk about things. And so when they suddenly understand that they have a mastery over their emotions and that they can do simple things like you know you get them to all lie down with a stuffy on their belly and you you teach them the basics of belly breathing like they're not thinking about that as a meditative technique or how it's affecting their neuroplasticity and how it's harnessing certain things they're just sitting there watching this you know trying to control the stuffy going up and down yeah. at a regular rate um you know, introducing the idea that they're rewiring their brain and they're tapping into certain parts of their brain. Like, they don't know, they don't care. And if you want to lose them in half a second, say, hypo, you know, hypothalamus. Say, you know, like, yeah. you know, exactly. But if you can tell them that this is one of the cool things that Dr. Strange does yeah. and use him as a metaphor for meditation and the ancient one, you, you have far better conversations and, and they will latch on to ideas that otherwise come across as like lessons and homework or, oh my God, she sounds just like mom. You know? <laughs> Whereas I'd rather be like the cool flaky lady with the pink hair that they might actually listen to because she wants to talk to them about Magneto and Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really good way to get in there, right? Because then instantly somebody's like, oh, okay. And then it doesn't feel um, like you said, boring or um, that somebody's trying to fix or figure you out. You're just like, now you're just having a conversation. Yeah. Um, and then you're just understanding. And most people just want to be understood or heard. And even if you relate back to um, Professor Xavier and Magneto, they were really yeah. good, right? And yeah. then one felt that they weren't being heard enough or understood and went one opposite direction from the other. Um, yeah. And you can even see even different versions of that play out and you can kind of see an extreme version of what's happening in the world right now of mm -hmm. um like that nobody lots of people aren't listening to each other so they're just talking yeah. louder over each other and without understanding um eventually becomes stronger where it's like turns into hate because you don't you fear and you hate which which is mm -hmm. not very nice and, and that's well, it's interesting that you mentioned Magneto too, because Magneto, in many respects, he's not a villain. He's the anti hero in the sense that he represents, in, in terms of how I use this metaphor, he represents somebody that's been persecuted his whole, his whole life based on his identity. And he lashes out. He's um, his form of defensiveness and self protection is I'm going to hit first before somebody hits me. I'm yeah. going to do this. You don't, and, and after being misunderstood and persecuted for so long, in some respects, his behavior is not at all surprising. And, and so in many respects, he represents those of us that have had really bad experiences, whether it's within the education system, the medical system, and too often we're dealt with this, oh, well, that's, you know, that person is dangerous, or they're this, or they're that. And I'm like, you know what, if your superpowers hulk out on you, and you at an early age before you're able to maybe accomplish something, be understood, be listened to, and you are suddenly dealt with as your label and your diagnosis, it's not surprising that you're going to end up like that. Whereas 
if you take, you know, now it's the okay, fine. So they've kind of grown up in this magneto way. Let's see if we can get them over to the Professor X side. And that's where I love working um, with medical professionals. So I've dealt with the uh, Canadian Federation of Mental Health Nurses. I've been working with pediatricians to help them uh, understand. And frankly, leveraging the fact that I was the health minister because they look at you a particular way and kind of go, oh, well, it's cool that the former minister of health responsible for a $6 billion budget, you know, wants to talk about superheroes. And it's like, yeah, okay look at when you look at me and go wow here's this person that's done this with this laundry list of diagnoses that's great and wonderful but i'm not exceptional i've just had the benefit of certain things i've had some totally crappy things happen when you look at me this way please look at me the same way if i show up on your front lines two weeks from now when it's all gone sideways and please look at every person that comes into you for crisis care the exact same way because we are no different. If I'm standing up on a stage, you know, speaking to you now, that's because I'm on my one of my good days. It doesn't mean that I haven't had days exactly like that person there. So remember me and treat them accordingly because that's, I think that's the first part of it is the compassion because again, you never know when something's going to go sideways and suddenly you're a superhero and maybe you'll only do a temporary episodic world in the, you know, the, the, the shitty place. Pardon my French. I hope that's not okay. <laughs> I hope that it's okay <laughs> in the podcast. <laughs> uh, beat that out. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, you might go through an episodic period of depression and you know what, if, if it only is an episodic thing and then you never deal with it again, hallelujah. I'm thrilled for you, but you shouldn't have to go through that to have the understanding and the empathy for the rest of us. And I think that's what I'm really trying to get across is that I hope to, you know, I don't want necessarily a world full of superheroes and it's not because I want us to be a half dozen special people, but the fewer of us that can go through this kind of grief, the better, and that the more tools we have and the more we understand it, maybe fewer people will go through things or maybe if they do go through things it will be less intense because they can be given tools in a manner that is helpful and that's the other part of it too is i take my mental health seriously i don't take myself seriously <laughs> and i know i've had so many times where somebody's given me what in retrospect was a really wonderful tool but they delivered it poorly oh here's some homework Oh, you didn't get that done. Well, you know you should be doing and like, oh, do not should on people. Yeah. <laughs> do not should on like no 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 yeah. time out, time out. And so that's the other part of it is that I want people to understand that you can have a bad day. There's nothing being again, being a superhero, anytime a superhero thinks they've got it nailed, well, that's when the supervillain comes out with a whole new toy and kicks their butt. <laughs> yeah. because they thought everything was cool and they went off and, like, and I'm not saying you live in like fear of something going sideways, but it's, it's sort of like what you do with, with training, right? We can get to a place where we feel comfortable, we feel confident. And then suddenly it's like, well, you know what, maybe I'll skip today. Or, well, maybe I'll do this and maybe I'll do that. And then all of a sudden it's, well, why did I throw my back out when I lifted whatever? And you're like, Oh, because I haven't done any core work in six weeks and maybe I shouldn't have tried to pick up the sofa by myself. Yeah. You know, and I forgot to lift, use my legs. Like it's, it's one of those, like not to say that it's self-inflicted and deserved, but you, you can get to that place in mental health as well, where you feel good and you think you can coast here and there. And that's the other, so superheroes also teach us that, you know, it's, it's a day at a time and you know what, sometimes it is going to happen and all you do is dust yourself back off, get yourself back into the war room, get your training undergoing and don't judge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. That is really good. And um, for everybody to understand, I think everybody, no matter what should take this kind of course or understanding um, again, because if you don't, uh, feel that maybe you have a disability, that's cool. It'd still be really interesting to see how a superhero might be going through something and then how like you can help people and be kind to people in everyday life. Because every I don't know a single person that does not have a bad day. Um, and it could be as, as simple as um, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, um, just a stranger that I was, uh, I was doing a, another podcast at a park. And um, he was asking me what we were doing. We we're social distancing. Don't worry, everybody. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he said he's uh, he was going through a tough time uh, last year, and um, somebody he was biking, and somebody opened the car door. Didn't hit him, but opened it a little bit, and just 
the guy that was biking started yelling at them and everything like that. He's like, it was early in the morning. He's like, I know I was having a bad day. Um, and then uh, it was a construction crew. And then uh, a woman got out from the other side of the car and said, are you okay? Like, can I buy you a coffee and this and that? And right away he calmed down and he said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell at you. I had other things on my mind and, and this and that. And um, he's like, at that moment, I was thinking about what a terrible world it is and how negative everybody is. And then within that same week, he said he was biking another time, going down a hill, and he did wipe out. Um, and a little, um, like, 10-year-old uh, child walked up to him on the way to school because it was early again and said, are, Mr., are you okay? Can I help you with anything? And he said, just that ah. alone um, made my day and changed everything again. So it's these small things. So maybe if somebody's freaking out at uh, the teller at the grocery store, um, and unfortunately this happens lots right now, and then the grocery store attendant mm. typically is usually kind and then listening, and then usually that person might not say sorry right then and there, but they might realize the time they're getting out of the store, be like, I didn't, I wasn't, that wasn't my A game. I'll yeah. <laughs> re- I'll, I'll reset <laughs> so that my next interaction with somebody is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the more that we know about each other um, and help each other in those difficult times, again, like nobody can be a superhero or on, on, on 24 seven. There's always. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always, and it's obstacle or opportunity. That was always um, my mantra when I was in office, especially when, again, with the health portfolio, and something and it's like, okay, well, how are we going to deal with that? Is that an obstacle? How, we have the choice to see it as an obstacle or an opportunity. And I mean, that's the other thing that's happening now that we're finding in the pandemic, right? Now, I'm not saying you, you, you know, you, you reframe to the point of delusion and you just, you know, uh, and I've watched some folks do some pretty interesting things where they, they kind of double down into stuff and overdo it but it's that idea of okay obstacle or opportunity so right now manitoba we've gone back into a harsher lockdown okay well you know what i have again i'm doing my own work that i've got to you know trying to juggle different things but it's also a case of i'm going to start some sewing projects i'm going to do some other things what's an opportunity what's a thing that i would normally go oh if i only had the time to do if i only had six uninterrupted hours stuck at home well, gee, now I got more than six uninterrupted hours. Mm, you know, <laughs> I can, yeah. what are those things? And, and, and again, is it going to be frustrating sometimes? You're going to get cabin fever sometimes? Absolutely. But I mean, what I've come to realize is it's been a huge prioritizing thing. And so it's that reframing and whether it's in the moment and yet the, like, oh, again, like the grocery stores or whatever it is and going out in public, it's like, no. I've got my mask on. I've got my sanitizer. I'm going to do whatever. No, I'm not going to judge that person over there that's got the mask between their nose under their nose. <laughs> I'm just not going to go down the same aisle as them. Yeah, yeah. Keep in mind, you know, not gonna. It, it, it's it's not worth it. I'm not here to educate them on that in that moment. For all I know, it just slipped down their face. Whatever. Not going to get into it. And so you just you have to reframe. And that's and honestly, a lot of what I do is about that reframing and keeping that idea of like I said, obstacle or opportunity. And it has been tough. I mean, you know, um, it it, it gutted my business within the within what 36, 48 hours. I watched three months of income go poof on yeah. March 12th because it was all public speaking gigs and people were like, oh, put it on Zoom. I'm like, it's with medical professionals. Yeah. <laughs> I think my audience is otherwise occupied and these people are not in the mood or do they have not have the time for webinars right now? Okay, so right now I'm seeing the obstacle. How do I create the opportunity? And we're all struggling with that. And I guess that's the other part is right now we're all knee deep in it. And from a superhero perspective, yeah, this is civil war. There are different things happening from all sides. And just recognize that most people are fighting some kind of a battle that you don't understand. Yeah, and true. they're operating on the last one raw nerve that you are. <laughs> so that's, that's, we all, if we're all just okay. So you know what? Be kind. Treat, you know, and, and it often, you often use that phrase about, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated with the understanding that somehow that, Unless you know somebody well enough, yes, that's okay. But also treat people it just in a kind way because sometimes maybe the, what I think is the way I want to be treated is not the way you want to be treated. But at least leading with a sense of kindness 
first yeah. and 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 presuming that that person that's you know having the meltdown in the grocery store is probably not for lack of something better to do it's probably because that last shred of sanity that they had somehow left the building you know two aisles before yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. and i i really like that that you mentioned that yeah just to be kind and then realize that most of the world is probably very close to their last straw <laughs> and some people can pull it back together faster than others um and and some things maybe it could be um as simple as your your pet or your child uh, making a bunch of background noise and maybe it wasn't agitating in a normal uh situation and maybe because um, a whole bunch of things got piled up that last little cry or, <laughs> or, or meow or whatever. And you're like, ah, just be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be extreme, but then you mm -hmm. can be like, okay, gather, yeah. gather, reflect, witness and be like, okay, maybe I need a five minute meditation. Maybe I need a little power nap. Maybe I need something for myself because you do need, most people do need self care. And unfortunately, um, most of us don't do it. This this year actually is a, is a good year where most people are paying attention to their health, I've noticed, mm -hmm. and taking the opportunity to realize I've been saying health is the greatest wealth all my life, but I haven't been doing it. I've been uh, running my life as in money is the most thing that matters or maybe something yeah. else. It doesn't have to be that, but I, whenever I do talks too, um, I'll be in a room, not big rooms, but sometimes 30 people, 40 people, and I'll always say, who here believes your health is your greatest wealth? Throw up your hand. And 99% of the people throw up their hand. And lots of times I know most of them. And I know that they're not doing that much for their health. <laughs> like, everybody's definition is different. So maybe yeah, like my yeah, definition yeah. is a five minute walk to the car. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like the, what are your investments in that? You know? Hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the other part of it too, is when we think about exactly that, like this opportunity to look after our health it can be really difficult. Like I know myself, I've had a hard time getting out for walks the way I used to. And a lot of it was just because of my heightened sense of anxiety. So it's okay. It's the elliptical or it's other things and, and trying to make those investments in our health and making them differently. And I do think this is where this is the opportunity part comes in is that we come up with more, sometimes more creative ways of doing it. And, and it is that reframing and realizing, okay, what is or isn't important. And, um, you know, what are the things that I need to actually do this? And so if I am going to be, you know, stuck in the house or if I am going to have limited options, what can I still do? Is it my normal go-to? Is it a trip to the gym with a full weight set and all the equipment? No, it just might be me and, you know, a training program like yours or, uh, oh, oh, wait a sec, I'm going to go dust off those yoga DVDs that I have, <laughs> whatever. And, and the, the part you mentioned too about the meditation, and this is what I love about the work that you're doing and it's stuff that I do in a different way myself where we uh, kind of myth bust what meditation is because too often it's put on this. And I mean, you know, it, it's, it's those Olympic style um, meditators that, that Goldman and, and Davidson talk about. You know, it's like, unless you are a monk somewhere and they're studying your brain and running you through the functional MRI, no, most of us are not getting into thousands of hours of meditation. And no, it doesn't have to be, you know, in, in, there's certain practices and different things, but honestly, a meditation can be as simple as a conscious in-breath and out-breath just yeah. to ground. And that's one of the, like, in terms of the superhero stuff, I talk about how your breath is your connection to your sidekick. And that, you know, and it's about learning different things. And as somebody that has, again, an anxiety disorder and had panic attacks back when I lived in Toronto and the smog was so much that I actually was having so many sinus infections, they were about a hair's breadth away from literally like opening my head and scraping out my sinuses. I moved out and suddenly I could breathe again. So dodge that surgical bullet. But um, so, I mean, I went through a period of my life where I actually had to sleep sitting up because I was so afraid. I would forget how to breathe at night. Right. That's how, so for me, breathing issues are there and meditation and ADHD brain. Oh my God. <laughs> Trying to meditate with ADHD. Well, again, if you think you're doing that, I am emptying my brain thing and I have to sit here and complete. No, if I can just come back to my breath or if I've got 
a candle to focus on or a spot yeah. to focus on whatever it is um i do i've done some guided meditations and those meditations so i do geek stuff in terms of superheroes but i also do work related to bts bang hang soyodan and they do a lot whether it's conscious or not they have embedded a lot of mental health messages in their music and one of the band members that i resonate with the most is um the rapper who goes by the name suga or august d minyungi and he is somebody that scott you know has like me um had suicidal thoughts has ADHD and there was a wonderful clip of them in Paris before a concert and they were they had recently read um Dodi's into the magic shop and they were trying to meditate and so you watch and they're all sitting around these three different sofas and two of them are trying to guide this visualized thing and he's just like I can't do this I got and he just sort of disrupts the whole thing he's like I got ADHD you're trying to talk about this I'm seeing some soldier with a wooden sword da, da, da. and he ends up, and and you get you watch like these seven different people where two of them are trying to bring it back a couple of them have got their eyes closed and they're trying to like they're what the heck's going on one of them decides he's going to stand up and do this yoga move and fling his foot up into the air kicks another guy in the face and this all unfolds in about like a 30 second window and I went that is literally my brain trying to meditate it starts off with the ADHD part and then that 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 and yeah literally one part of my brain is kicking the other and so i've developed guided meditations where i will use a particular song and use the idea of lyrics or ideas as mantras knowing that there are folks like myself for whom sitting in silence can be difficult whereas yeah. if you have a voice to follow then that voice can i mean there can still be periods of silence but you, but you again you sort of know when to chime back in and go okay well now and do yeah. and so if that helps other folks and so i'm going to be developing some uh of the superhero ones i mean in my in my perfect world what i would obviously love to do is to be able to work with both entities and i've got scripts for at, you know for uh marvel meditations that in my perfect world it wouldn't be me reading them it would be benedict cumberbatch but um, <laughs> you know but but that's because he also does buddhist meditation and is doctor strange so who else would you have yeah. to your <laughs> narrate your meditation program in my nerd world um but yeah so it's 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 people have got to understand that there's more than one way of doing a thing and yeah. the thing that works for you might not work for somebody else or the thing that even works for you now might not always work and that that's where the toolkit comes in and so that's where like i said what i've loved about your program is the five different kinds and then find the one that works for you um yeah. because it's not a one size fits all exactly and like you said if we're just talking simply about meditation as a tool like there's so many different tools people can use and there's so many different ones that there isn't just most people do think meditation so like close my eyes think for like uh an hour of silence or this and that it could be as simple as uh, i was taught by a couple of people um just light a match throw it in a bowl whenever it burns out you're done but just try to focus on just the match yeah. for me even that alone um i was like uh and then think about what i need to do so my meditation is stuff that i'm already doing so if you can encompass it in something you're doing whereas so if i'm working out maybe i'm doing a chest pressing exercise i'm closing my eyes I'm visualizing engaging all my muscles, imagining feeling the blood flow through it and then that relax and calms and then it helps me in what I'm passionate about which is working out because I can recover faster because my cortisol levels aren't going through the roof, my body's getting to rest a little bit whereas the old way I used to be trained when I was trained by uh, more so pro bodybuilders is more amp yourself up, think of something you get angry about. and what would happen often is you would get injured not necessarily because of the heavy weights you're lifting you'd get injured because your body's already stressed mm -hmm. um and and i used to do this sometimes out of anger when i was going through my things when i um i had my own issues of uh mm -hmm. rage or depression and stuff like that so i'd try to i don't like cardio but when i would do it then i'd run as fast as i could out of anger and You like why well, so do something when you could overdo it <laughs> exactly and then, and then i kept hurting myself and tearing my Achilles and i tracked the speed that i used to go at because i'm i like tracking things and yeah. then uh i met somebody that uh encouraged me um to just run like a kid have fun and just let loose and then i adopted that into the newer style of training that i teach and i realized i can go actually significantly faster and nothing got injured because nothing was really stressed and then i came out and was able to not get hurt. So it was cool that I was yeah. able to 
progress faster, repair faster, and not injure myself. Um, so it's, mm-hmm. it's like the old school ways of like you used to see on the symptoms when they have go through uh, the course of like they, um, everybody's being counseled and they're like, they have the bat and the foam bat and yeah. they like hit each other. And now they realize... <laughs> oh, that actually amps things up and sometimes makes it way worse. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. Well, and it's interesting too, because two things you mentioned there, first of all, had to do with fun and engagement. And that's the other part of it is that yeah. if we want to do anything that is is positive and productive, we have to be engaged. That's also where, again, from a neurodiversity perspective, um, you know, my ADHD doesn't mean I can't focus. It's just you have, I have to have something you have to get, you have to work a little harder to get me to focus, but by God, once I focus, have fun breaking that focus. You know, I mean, again, so many of the Halloween costumes and comic stuff that we build, it's like, yeah, that's been me down like the, just one more thing, just one more scene. Mom, it's 2.30 in the morning. I get that it's a Saturday and nobody needs to be up in the morning. The rest of us can't sleep with the sewing machine on. You know what? The Deadpool costume here in the morning and you know when's the last time you fed yourself and you're like oh yeah yeah, maybe um so yeah like i can focus i can hyper focus to my own detriment so it's that but but it's because engagement and i think that's the same thing with the health part of it and it also shows that that sweet spot we have to find that place where we can get engaged but not overdo it and i have to say when like you're talking about the meditative aspect of the workouts that's actually one of the things that I've noticed in starting your program was that it wasn't a hit the ground running, do whatever. It was literally about becoming attuned with my body. And it was interesting to be able to go from watching the videos and go, okay, fine, to realizing that there were some cases where I couldn't actually watch my body. I actually had to close my eyes and it's like, how does this feel? Okay, so open my eyes. Okay, so I do have the right position, the right thing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to focus on, I can keep a better track and and be more attuned and get the right form now that I know how it feels when my tendons are doing this or how it, I'm so, like, I rotate my ankle all the time. I don't necessarily know what that feels like. Now I'm suddenly becoming aware of it. And so it was really interesting because um, I originally thought, okay, I'm going to have music going on and be doing this and that. And it's like, no, you know, these, here's these four reps of this. Well, that's, that's literally a meditative moment of, of being attuned with that part of my body. Maybe it's my ankles and then maybe it's, you know, my shoulders. And it was this really interesting thing. And I think that's the other part that people can recognize is that meditation can come in a variety of forms and that can be a meditative moment in and of itself, as opposed to, well, I got to do X number of reps. Boom, 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 boom. Like, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, yeah, any, so, almost anybody I, can do it that way. If not, they'll just like crank it out and not pay attention. But I like, cool. I like what you kind of described that it is just thinking about that one thing is actually meditative because that's all you're thinking about. And you're, there's not, there's not what I'm going to eat later. It's not, it's like, what does this feel like? Interesting. And then you open your eyes and you're like, Oh, okay. It's doing this. Close the eyes. What does it feel like again? Yeah. And, and I think that gives us greater awareness of our body. And that is where that body, mind, spirit connection comes into that in the same way that you've talked about, you know, that idea that, you know, okay, well, yeah, we're all in our health. And meanwhile, you watch, we, we, we've disconnected and we've compartmentalized. And so it's the, I do this at work. And then after work, I can maybe go to the, you know, I'll go to the gym or I'll do this fitness related thing. And, um, whereas you can work things into, I mean, when I, when I was in health and I mean, I'm sure it caught some folks off guard because there I was in like three and four inch heels, but I would come into the building. My office was on the top floor and I could have very easily because of the way the office was, I could have literally just walked into the building, went to the elevator and took it up the three flights. And it was like, no, I'm walking the few extra steps past that. And I'm walking the three flights of stairs up to my office. I am walking down the stairs. My, I am, you know, I am not taking an elevator if I don't have to, because I'm bogged down with stuff. And the one benefit of being health minister is usually somebody's following you and offering to carry stuff for you. Yeah. Um, so, so it was a case of, you know, that more at the end of the day, possibly if I've got my, you know, my yoga gear and this and that maybe, but I still always made a point. And it was one of those things where people were like, well, why do you do that? And it's like, well, because right now I am stuck in an office 
and doing this and doing that. And I, you know, sadly, I can't do walking meetings with my staff because I can't drag around 12 people from the department talking about a confidential situation as we roam the hallways of the yard outside. Yeah. So I'm going to walk wherever I can. And I think that's where a lot of us need to sort of hey, make it fun again. Yeah. It's not just I'm going for a walk because of this. So, you know, I'm, I'm stuck here at home with my son. He's remote learning. We're trying to get out and do walks where he's, he, we're trying to resurrect the Pokemon thing. And trying to see, uh, yeah. ah, you know, it, it, it gives us an excuse. Is he really, is he and I really into it? No, but you know what? If it gets us out and then we'll have a conversation about this or let's go walk past whatever, like find a way of making it fun. Yeah, like we have I this. agree. If we if we're having fun, then you suddenly don't go. It's not like I have to do a five k walk. It's the oh, really? Oh, I walk I walk five k. How did that happen? Yeah. That's how you should be. <laughs> you know, exactly. people should be looking at their pedometer or their their counter at the end of the. Oh wow, that was so much fun, and I actually did this as opposed to oh my god, I've got one point eight more kilometers to go. You know. <laughs> No, it, it it does make sense. And if you're already doing something and you can incorporate it to your day, like you said, like choose the stairs if you have an option or the Pokemon game when it first came out, so many more people were like, actually, I'll walk to work or I'll park further away because there's a Pokestop over there and I, I'm going to get to that and I need so many steps to hatch my egg and blah, blah, blah. So if you ever played the game, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you yeah. didn't, <laughs> it was, I noticed a significant amount of my clients back then added so much more cardio to it uh their day like a significant amount because it became fun and like you said instead of i have to do this i get to do this yeah and I, and i try to encourage everybody to think into i'm lucky i get to do this it's not i have to it's like you make the choice and i'm lucky i, I get to do this and oh wow I, I did all these steps today so um just be nice to yourself um yeah. and like you said if you're already have an option to maybe take the stairs or park slightly further away or some kind of opportunity. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It's just these small steps, whether it's mental or physical health, all add up. So this month you did a couple of things and you stay consistent with that. And then it becomes your new normal and yeah. becomes easy. And then maybe you're like, hmm, what else can I add? And then a whole year goes by and now you have a few tools that you've been using consistently and you add a couple more. And then 10 years goes by, like you, this year is almost over. Look how fast that flew by. It yeah. seemed like it should have dragged on forever. And some moments felt like it. And yeah. some moments you're like, oh my God, like what <laughs> month is it? What day is it? Um, yeah, so imagine yeah. if all these things were opportunities, if we could change that, like you yeah. have the opportunity and you already told me that you're creating these amazing courses online and mm -hmm. maybe you wouldn't have the opportunity to have done it or maybe done it this fast if the world didn't kind of slow down or force us into uh, an opportunity of staying home. <laughs> well, and, and this is the other part too about the movement to online and the use of apps and, and apps and technology are, um, they're like superpowers, they're neutral, they're tools. And so uh, in some of the work that I did in office had to do with cyber technology and, uh, person and privacy as well as cyber technology in terms of its use and abuse. And so, for example, there was an app that could spoof a phone number and people were like, oh, well, we need to get rid of that because abusive people are spoofing their phone numbers, they're calling their, vic their previous victims and they're alleging to be their sister or something like that. And it's like, okay, the intent is clearly bad, wrong, and yes, we need to do something about those people, but you realize that same app is protecting a woman who is um, using it to spoof a phone number so that she can live in a different province safely and people don't. So it's the, it's, it's not the tool, it's the intent. And this is the whole thing when we start getting into tech. And I know a lot of us, especially with the isolation are spending more time online and we're doing these different things. Well, like everything else, it's about balance. Like I know that with my, my son, uh, his playing certain video games, communally, you know, the, 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 the role playing games, that's a place where he and his buddies, uh, whether it's high school classmates or some friends of his in Ontario, that's how they communicate now. And so that's what, so that there's a social aspect to it. Um, there's, uh, again, in terms of apps and like I said, what I'm trying to develop, which again, sort of a mental health parallel to what you're doing. It's the, you know what? 
there are tools there and we can load our phones with really good tools um, or we can fall down the doom scrolling <laughs> hole. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's a matter of everything. It's like everything, else, everything in moderation. Yes, apples, you know, the proverbial an apple a day. Great. Incorporate apples into your diet. If you are trying to live strictly off Granny Smith apples, I'm pretty sure that's not a good dietary move, right? So yeah. it's the same kind of, of thing where I think our relationship with technology, people are recognizing the pros and the cons, because as much as it was the video game is bad, kids are spending too much time on this and that, blah, 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 blah. Look what TikTokers did politically this year. Yeah. <laughs> like, God bless millennials, TikTok, and the political things that they've accomplished, um, because they were able to network in a particular way for, for social change. So, you know what, do I want my kid living on TikTok? No, is there some crap on there? Absolutely. But at the same time, it's what you choose to do with it. And I've also watched folks take healthy tools and use them to uh, where they go, where it goes from self care to self sabotage. I watched a, a friend of mine who, you know, decided that everything was going to be about meditation. Well, again, unless you're a Buddhist monk living in a monastery somewhere, I'm pretty sure 18 hours a day of meditation is excessive. Um, you know, Unless you're one of those super meditators, that's not going to solve your problems because if you're spending your, all of your waking hours doing that, well, then you're not in relationship with people. You're not doing all of these, you know, you're in your own head. And that, again, we need to, we definitely need to be self-aware, but it's so, you know, if you're cranking out that you're, you're using that meditation app, but you're plugged into it for 18 hours, how is that any different than doom scrolling? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, how is that any different than... You know, so so it's about um, instead of villainizing and vilifying stuff, going how is it useful and is it a healthy use? Will will this audio book be the thing that accompanies me on my walk and yeah. inspire me to keep going? Um, you know, I, I can tell you, like, yeah, there are certain authors, and the fact that the Obamas have come out each with a book this year got a lot of walking done listening to Michelle Obama. Boy, she will keep you moving, not because she's, it's just you're like, how can I not keep walking and being in a good state of mind with Michelle Obama in my ears telling me all yeah. these amazing stories? So uh, it, that's the other part is using the two tools wisely. Yeah, I 100% agree. It's it's uh, the same debate that's going on worldwide. It's like, okay, this is terrible, don't use it. It's like, okay, well, like you said, there's positives and there's negatives. And if we can kind of educate people on how both could affect, it's like, okay, if you're doing this, yeah, it could be negative and this is how it might possibly harm you or others um, or it might help others. Um, and kind of knowing yourself too, like I also have an addictive personality and I know that. Yep, so I just have to be cautious of what I get into because same thing, I could um, do the meditation and find I love it. So I get joy out of it. So guess what? I want to do more of it and then more of it and more of it. So We're knowing that going that in. that dopamine hit, right? It's all about exactly. the dopamine hit and, and it's the finding a variety of ways of getting the dopamine hit and knowing that your body can't live entirely up in that dopamine hit. It's, you know, it, it, it you don't want like up and down roller coaster rides, you know, mentally, chemically. We all need a little bit of this and that. But if you're always seeking out the dopamine hit, exactly, and, and seeking it out from the same source, eventually, even, and it's, it's the same thing that happens with chemical dependencies and chemical use. Eventually, whatever that thing you're doing, you have to go farther and farther and farther to get the hit. And so it's, again, it's so much of it is about self-awareness and balance and and that those are those are daily exercises and that you can think you've got it nailed but if you have a day that you slip or this and that it's not a failure it's acceptance and non-judgment um every day is unique be great i mean and i guess maybe that's just how i view things again from that mental health perspective knowing that the stuff that i live with is not going to go away i don't live in fear of it but i am grateful for every day that goes well but I don't beat myself up for the bad days. Or if I find myself doing that, I catch myself or I try my best to catch myself and go, Oh, okay. Yeah. That's me. What do I do to turn it around? Is it going to turn around? Am I going to be able to pivot like that? No. 
possibly not, but I'm at least conscious of the fact that I have to pivot. And so I can sit, you know, okay, yeah, I've spent an hour on Facebook. You did you put it down. No, no, no. I don't need to debate that person. And that's one of the challenges I have now with the whole COVID thing. You find yourself putting on the, I used to teach in nursing, was health minister. You know what? That Yavo on my friend's thread is not there to learn. They're there to rant. They yep. clearly drank some conspiracy theory, Kool-Aid. <laughs> Will this do anything for my mental health to try to educate that person? Oh, based on the interactions with three other people that have tried that. Yeah, no. Nope. Perfect time to put the phone down. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Use that as my opportunity. Okay, there's the, the universe has given me a sign. <laughs> exactly, and and I I too um, have similar uh, problem with that as well. So, um, and and I realized even before all this too, um, because you people in the healthcare industry typically just want to help. Yes. Yeah. And we want to educate, so we feel. Uh, like a long time ago, I used to just burn myself repeatedly, burn out myself repeatedly because I'd help people that really didn't even ask for my help. But I was yeah. like, oh, they need my help. Then I yeah. learned not to do that anymore. But then I learned through social media, then you try to help people this way or um, other little things. And then over time, every year, you get a little bit better of realizing it's like, okay, how can I savor my energy and help the people that want help around me? Um, yeah. And one thing that I had to do is because every time I get a notification, I feel like, oh, it's an emergency. I have to respond right now. Yes. And, and I realized, so almost everything on my phone now, I turned off all the badge icons. So there's not a number one, two, three. There's not a red button. There's no dings, no vibrates. Um, I have it set that if I just um, slide down from the top of my screen, yeah. then I can see some notifications, but only the ones I control. Yeah. Uh, and then if I slide it up, I can't see anything because it's inevitable. Almost all of us walk around with our phones, almost with us everywhere. And it's inevitable. You will check your email maybe a few times a yeah. day. So you'll see it when you get it uh, or that text message. You'll, you'll, when you open up the app, then you can see maybe some people text messages you. Maybe you can't do that because maybe you have something that you with the one or two people where you have to accept that call immediately. But think about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, as I was watch, re-watching old Friends episodes, um, people would just write a note, gone to the store, I'll be back at three. Or using the pay phone when you can and be like, hey, I'll meet <laughs> you at this place for on Friday at six. Great. And then you don't yeah. communicate again. And it just worked out. Well, so exactly. same thing. You don't, it's not an emergency. Um, and maybe if they call you 10 times in a row, probably maybe then it is an emergency. <laughs> but This is it. But it, And it's really interesting. And that was a really hard habit for me to break because I didn't have, um, well, I didn't really have a cell phone before I went into office. I had had like one of these tiny little, it was like archaic old Nokia that um, basically I just put X number of dollars on. And it was because once a week I would take a two hour bus trip out to Brandon University to teach. And it was more just, should I get stuck in a storm, this and that, but it was more to call and say, hi, I've arrived safely. Or, and then, hey, I'm on my way home, that kind of thing. Or, hey, guess what? The blizzard took us and we're stuck in blah, 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 blah. I'll be late. Don't, you know, don't come to pick me up. I'll call you when I get into town kind of thing. And so when I ran for office, I had to get my, so old it is, I had to get my first flip phone. Um, and you got, and then I was given a BlackBerry and you, and especially the, again, the more you progress through the, you become surgically attached to this thing yeah. and you do get very, uh, and especially when I got into health and this and that, because, oh my God, you never knew and what was going on. And there was all these different kinds of things. And so it was always that sense of, well, if the world's on fire, because by God, the one time you had the, the volume off, well, then that's when this important thing happened and so-and-so was flipping out. And it took a long time to break that habit of if, you know, is the world going to fall off its axis? Is something on fire? Is somebody bleeding? Um, and, you know, exactly. Don't need all the notifications. Don't need to check this immediately. Um, and especially, and I think this is the other thing a lot of folks in the, during this pandemic, is that most of us, our sense of time has gone out the window yeah. and, and and that you know what instead of like oh my god so and so sent an email and I've got an email right back right away it's like a lot of times what I'm finding is that most of us have got pandemic brain and so it's the oh 
oh crap, there was that email that I was supposed to, but the thing happened and the and, and you're sending back the email with the uh hi, yeah, so da 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 and they're like, that's okay because I'd forgotten about it too. And and I think <laughs> honestly, let's sort of take that going forward because what I've yeah. also come to realize is that sometimes when somebody's sending you that email at eight o'clock in the evening, it's not because they want to reply at that, you know, at eight fifteen. It's because, oh my God, I finally have X number of minutes to myself. I'm going to send the email now while yeah. I'm thinking of it so that maybe it's in your email in the morning or when you get to it, not the, I'm sending it. If anything, it's more like I'm sending it out now, then I can forget about it and move on. And then I'll, you know, when you reply, that's fine. And if you send them back something right away, they're going to be like more freaked out. Like, no, it's, it's, it's eight o'clock on a, on a Wednesday. I don't really, just, whoa, back off. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I think we need to kind of relax that way. Or like you're mentioning about the phone calls. I think about back when we did things with letters. Remember how somebody used to like, sit down at by hand or with a typewriter and then they had to like nail it <laughs> and then somebody had to sit down read it reply back and mail it and now it's like everybody acts like every email and every text is something that if they don't reply to in the next x number of seconds like what is that doing to our hippocampus and to our our amygdala and and all of these other kinds of things it's like yeah again deep breaths world's not on fire or sometimes yeah. it feels like it's on, I'm just on these, but the world's not on fire because of whether this email gets replied to or not. Yeah. And so I think that's the, that's only I'm hoping that some folks get from this situation for all the other big stuff that's going on here. A lot of the things that we have been trained to worry about um, have suddenly all become derailed or it reprioritized. And I yeah. hope that that reprioritization is taken forward into whatever the new normal is if and when we get to a new normal and we recognize that you know we need our boundaries we need a, i'm no good to anybody if i'm not looking after myself i can't pour from a full cup from an empty cup it's got to be a full one so what am i doing to keep my cup full and to help others fill their cups and and those kinds of things so i'm, I'm hoping that this is a reframing that allows people to be more self-aware and compassionate and, and have self-compassion as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and we did need that. Um, we didn't necessarily need all the chaos that comes with it, but you know what? Sometimes <laughs> yes. with big chaos makes big change typically in yep. history, right? So um, I'm choosing to look at most things um, most of the time, sometimes I go into negative thoughts, but then yeah. most of them I'm taking as opportunities. So in this little case of just a technology piece, we're learning from all these things on the internet that maybe we just need to educate people a little bit more on maybe different news sources or how to use your smartphone, how to get less anxiety from all these notifications or mm -hmm. the courses that people are able to take now because you can't take it in person. Now I have the opportunity to train with this instructor maybe that I always wanted to train to, but I never could make the time off work to travel to this place. I can take this course online now. Um, so there's more, more and more opportunities out there um, for, for the majority of people right now. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's a really good, I mean, I think of, again, how you and I connected. It's been during this window and, <laughs> and that I would not be training with you or, you know, again, you, you, you've got this stuff online and I can do this as opposed to before that would have like, first of all, even though you're from Winnipeg, I would not necessarily have known you're out there and that would involve going to Vancouver. Um, yeah. So there's things like that. I've had, I've presented at conferences and at things that I, I still think of this one. Uh, it's a, uh, the Learning Disabilities Association here, and they were doing their annual learning summit, and they're used to doing this small little thing that, has, you know, it's a lot of local audience, this and that, and this year it turned into an international event with, you know, yes, there were, you know, twice as many people, but they were also from, like, Four different continents which they never got before you know like <laughs> just like you know it would more like be four different parts of town oh look there's the river heights people there's the st james people like the st patel people no this was like okay here's this person in south africa here's this person here and we were able to have ideas like that um presented recently at a conference in jeju south korea and it but i did it from right where i'm sitting now and was listening to people from south korea from uh, you know the U.S., from the U.K., from the Philippines, 
and we can do these things now. Do I miss traveling? Absolutely. Do I want to be able to do those kinds of conferences in person at some point? Absolutely. But you know what? It's kind of cool because I don't know if we would have got together yeah. otherwise. And I've met some people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. So yeah, it's again, reframing. It's always, reframing. The, you know, if we, yeah, reframing. <laughs> Uh, are you yeah, obstacle or opportunity and what are you doing with the lemons okay we've just been handed lemons are you sucking on them and getting all sour faced or are you turning around and making lemonade to serve to yourself and others and you've got the choice it's yeah, the same lemon exactly the lemon is neutral <laughs> what are you doing with it <laughs> i like that and, and that's a perfect topic to just kind of like end this with and, yeah. and let everybody reflect and think about basically um i think you said it extremely well um, you have the control. Um, and once we have the control, we can feel a little bit safer and then make our decisions on our, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I know we probably talked longer than expected, but this has been really <laughs> wonderful. It's so nice to connect with folks that are on a similar wavelength and that we can, again, as educators that are concerned about health, share messages with people to empower them to give them that security and peace of mind that they need right now which a lot of folks are missing and and to give them the faith in themselves that it's okay it's not about how many times you fall down or stumble it's about how many times you dust yourself off and stand up again and that we're exactly. all doing that exactly i like that that's really well said <laughs> and so for anybody that's listening um where can they find more information about you what would be the best way to get in contact with you is it your uh, site best, or? yeah it, it would be my site it's um right now it's www.speak-up.co and that talks about what i call the girl gospel of mental health so it includes my embrace your superpowers program which is the marvel and superhero based way of reframing and it also includes bulletproof to stigma which is the the bts bang kong soyudan inspired mental health and its uh programs and so i do public speaking and um and offer uh workshops through that again mostly online and i'm in the process now of developing a membership website where folks would be able to join a community we're going to start off with the superhero ones and where people would be able to basically work through mental health tools um, in a superhero context and build community uh, like you're doing with your fitness program so that they have a way of acquiring tools so i'm looking to launch that uh early in the new year that's awesome so yeah um, I'm really excited for that because I want to learn more about that as well <laughs> and, and see how you're doing that. Um, so yeah, so for anybody listening, definitely check out her site, take an opportunity to just learn a little bit, see if it's the right fit for you or for someone else. Um, if you're listening to this or following it on YouTube or Spotify, just subscribe because there's always cool things that we're always talking about. So thank you so much, Sharon, for joining us today. Um, thank you so much for having me. <laughs>